first of all, regarding your midterms, if you have complaints about your grade, please first uh, do what uh, my admin told you to do so that the tutors can double check your mark. And uh, only if you are unhappy with the result, uh, uh, come to my office and I will uh, look at, we, we will look together at your midterm. But please don't, I got inundated with emails uh, um, from students. Uh, there are 720 students in the course, so I just don't have the bandwidth uh, to deal myself with everything. So please uh, first uh, try to try to get the issue resolved uh, through this channel with the tutors, and uh, if you are unhappy, uh, then uh, you can come to my office hours uh, to look at your midterm uh, together with me. And so if you haven't received your mark, please uh, deal with the uh, admin, uh, because I don't have the records still. Uh, he has the marks and they are not uploaded uh, into SMS yet, so I cannot even see them. So uh, please don't, don't bombard me with emails. I'm getting paranoid to open my Gmail because uh, there are a couple of, uh, well, a couple of dozens at least emails from students. Uh, um, so that's, the first thing, secondly, um, so for the remaining of the course, we will be mostly uh, using the techniques uh, that we learned to solve uh, um, various problems after we finish with the string matching algorithms, right? Um, so, and of course, we will also practice uh, for the final. Uh, I will prepare a list of problems just as I did for the midterm and then later on I will also release uh, solutions but you should try to solve them by yourselves uh, uh, as many of them as possible okay so and on the final there will be only the material starting from uh, in the including dynamic programming till the end of whatever we are going to cover in the course and soon we will release uh, another assignment for you to practice dynamic programming. So, uh, you know, the exam is approaching, so please uh, start preparing immediately, practice problem solving. Okay, so next topic that we want to cover is uh, string matching algorithms that have uh, uh, really a very wide uh, um, applicability. Uh, you might be, for example, searching for a gene in a very long uh, genome. Please, uh, you are dis disrupting uh, others, distracting others if you talk. Please don't talk. Um, so uh, you have a gene and you want to see whether it appears in a particular genome. So maybe the gene is uh, a couple of thousand of uh, base pairs long, but your genome is a billion, so I guess about three billion base pairs long. So uh, searching uh, from, for a particular string uh, is uh, a non-trivial task, right? Uh, what would be the naive way? Well, you start from the beginning of the long string and you simply match uh, uh, check if the characters match. If the, the moment you discover there is a mismatch, you shift for one um, uh, uh, letter to the right and repeat this procedure. But obviously, uh, this can be, if the string that you are looking for is reasonably long, this is pretty inefficient way of uh, doing it. So usually, we don't search by brute force. Uh, so there are clever algorithms that uh, speed up significantly uh, the search uh, that are important for practice. So the worst case performance uh, 
of these algorithms is as bad as the brute force, but in practice this never happens. So uh, let's see how, um, how this is done in a, a cleverer way. So assume that you have two strings, A and B, that are in an alphabet A with D many symbols, right? So if you are searching for a, a genome, uh, for a gene inside the genome, uh, D will be, just, will be four, right? Because there are four uh, bases. Um, so, uh, so we will now, sh I will uh, show you a very clever algorithm that combines recursion and hashing to produce a very efficient string matching uh, algorithm. So the idea is that you first compute the hash value for the string that you are looking for. So that would be string B, right? Um, and then you compute the hash value of each substring of the long string that is of the same length. And only if the hash values match, you then double check uh, by brute force, right, uh, letter by letter, whether these two uh, strings are in fact equal, right? So this is, this is the idea. But now, in order for this to make sense, this hash function has to be computable in an extremely efficient way, right? Because otherwise, computing the hash value of, of the string should not take more time than comparing um, a letter by letter with uh, the string B. So uh, this is where the recursion comes into the play. So to formulate the setup, assume that your symbols are S0, S1 up to SD minus one, right? Well, we can map these uh, symbols into their indices, uh, right? So instead of having symbols that can be arbitrary, you would now have just integers between zero and uh, d minus one. Now we use the trick that we saw in the beginning of this course, namely uh, you can, uh, for each string, you can assign naturally a number so that uh, uh, the values B1 up to Bm are simply the digits of that number in base D, right? Because, right, all the digits are between 0 and D minus 1. So if you have digits B1, B2, Bm, all between 0 and D minus 1, if you form this expression, this is simply a representation of an integer in the basis uh, with the base D, okay? So um, how do we compute uh, this uh, value? Well, that can be efficiently done using the Horner's uh, rule to reduce it, for example, into binary representation or decimal representation. Uh, right, this is simply evaluation of uh, this expression where we simply keep pulling out uh, multiples of D, right, uh, to reduce the number of multiplications so that we don't have to compute the powers of D, right? Now, the problem with this function H that assigns to each string an integer is that uh, h of b can be truly gigantic and there is no chance that it can fit in the register. For example, uh, if you are searching for a gene or that is, uh, say, a few thousand uh, base pairs uh, long, uh, then you will have a few thousand uh, digits uh, in base four, right? So this, of course, cannot fit in a register, so it is not, it doesn't allow uh, an, an efficient computation. So um, the trick now is that uh, you 
choose a large prime number p so that the product d plus 1 times p fits in a single register, right? And now you notice that uh, so far everything is one to one. From this number you can uniquely read out the symbols of your string, but this is now where the hashing happens because we mod out this value by this large prime number p. So p is as large as possible, but so that d plus 1 times p fits in a single register of your machine. Okay. So what do we do next? So uh, remember, a is a very, very long uh, string of uh, symbols. And for example, let's look at the position uh, starting with the S place, right? Uh, um, uh, and, and you have uh, symbols AS, AS plus 1 up to AS plus M minus 1. And you want to find out whether this string is identical to your string B, right? So now you can do for this substring exactly the same trick. You can assign its hash value that is this very large integer modded out by this prime number p, right? Uh, and now we first compare the hash values of b and hash value of this substring as. And if these hash values, which are now uh, relatively, I mean, they are of manageable size, they fit into a register, even when you multiply them by d plus 1, they still fit into a register. So these will be small numbers that you can uh, compare in a single clock cycle, right? You can compare this, whether this uh, value, capital H of AS, is equal to the capital H of B. And uh, um, if the hash values match, then you do uh, symbol by symbol comparison. Now the trick is that P is a reasonably large prime number. So this uh, value modded out by P uh, will produce few false positives, right? Because P is large, so you have a span between 0 to P minus 1 for these values. And p is reasonably large, so the number of false positives will be small, right? But now for all of this to make sense, this value, h of as, should be computable extremely fast, in constant time, in just a few clock cycles. And this is where recursion comes into the play. Um, you see, the idea is the following. Uh, if, the, if you have hash value for this uh, subsequence, AS up to AS plus M minus 1, then if you shift for one position to the right and you start with AS plus 1 and you finish with AS plus M, the hash value of the new sequence uh, is not computed from scratch. It's computed from the hash value of the previous sequence, right? How is uh, uh, this uh, done? Well, you see, it's uh, a very clever trick. So the hash value is this expression, right? Uh, we form this uh, integer right, in which AS, uh, they are all uh, uh, integers between 0 and D minus 1, so they are digits in, of rep in a representation of, in base D. So, and then we mod it out by P. So let us now uh, compute what the product of D times hash value of AS mod P is. So if I multiply this by D, right, I can go inside the mod P and uh, lo and behold, all what happens is that I increase the power of D everywhere by one, 
right? Now I split this by taking out the first, the very first element, and I distribute mod of the sum is sum of the mods, right? So I will go with mod inside and obtain this. And now notice what I have left here, right? Is almost the hash value of the next sequence that starts with AS plus one, right? Except that I am missing here the very last element, which is a s plus m, right? If you have, let's see, in the previous, if you have this uh, sequence, right, then if you start with a s plus 1, the last value here will be a s plus m. So in order to get the hash value correctly, I add to this expression the very last element, mod it out by p, and then I subtract the element that I added. So now what is inside here is precisely the hash value of the next, of the shifted sequence, right? And now if I solve this for a h plus 1, I get that uh, uh, h of a s plus 1 will be equal to this uh, guy here, which is d times uh, ah of s, right? Minus, I have to subtract now uh, uh, this value here, right? So here it is, d to the power m mod p times as, right? And I have to move this to the other side of equation so it becomes positive, and I mod it out by p. So notice, so this gives you an extraordinarily simple recursion to compute the hash value of shifted sequence for one uh, letter to the right uh, simply by multiplying the hash value of the previous sequence by d, subtracting this value here, which is the first element uh, of the previous sequence, and just adding the last element of the new sequence, right? Now, d to the m can be pre-computed, right? Um, d to the m mod p can be pre-computed, so it's a fixed integer that doesn't depend on, uh, on the symbols at all, right? Um, and so, and this expression also obviously um, uh, except for this factor, which can be pre-computed, doesn't depend on the length of, uh, of B. So all what you have to do is multiply hash previous hash value by D, multiply AS by this fixed number, pre-computed fixed number, subtract, and then add the new symbol. So this is just a few operations. So the update, uh, computing the hash value of the next sequence from previous sequence, right, uh, is extremely fast. And this is what makes, uh, uh, why the algorithm makes sense. You see, that's the same trick as uh, um, the one that you had on the, was it on the midterm? Uh, say you have a very long sequence of uh, um, uh, numbers, and you want to find all po products of, say, of 100, uh, every window of 100 uh, elements of that sequence, uh, say the sum of 100 elements of the sequence. How would you do this efficiently? So you have a very long sequence of numbers, right? Very, very long. And say I want to compute all sums of, say, four consecutive integers, or instead of four, maybe, say, a hundred consecutive integers for all possible four, a hundred consecutive uh, subsequence. How would you do this? 
would you sum up this, then move for one element and sum up the next four? Hmm? Exactly. Simply what you do, if you have this sum, you simply subtract the last one and you uh, add the next one. Right? So only two addition, one subtraction and one addition, and recursively makes it much easier than doing it. This is the same trick, right? Because the hash value of this subsequence uh, is computed from the hash value of the previous subsequence. Simply by dropping this digit and adding this digit, but because the sequence can be very long and it cannot fit in the register, instead of just taking these uh, uh, digits, you mod out the numbers by certain prime p so that the remainder can, uh, can fit into a register, right? And then this shows just like what we did here, drop this one and add that one. This is essentially what we do here. Uh, this is dropping the first one. This is adding the last one, right? And this is just adjusting the powers uh, um, of, uh, of D, right? But the idea is exactly uh, the same. So you can... Uh, um, uh, so you, the, you can re recursively uh, compute the hash values in an extremely efficient way using just uh, uh, right, one uh, multiplication here plus another multiplication here. So two multiplications and one subtraction and one addition and then uh, modding out everything by, by P. So um, this is all extremely efficient. So as you do the search now, you keep computing the hash values. The moment you get a hash value equal to the hash value of B, you stop and then you do the comparison letter by letter to see whether you have a match or it was a false positive. And the idea is if P is a large prime, right, there will be P many different hash values between zero and P minus one. So the number of false positives uh, uh, will be uh, reasonably small. And so the algorithm will run much faster than the brute force search, right? So it's a clever combination of recursion and uh, hashing. Okay, so uh, we want to look at another method, which is uh, string matching with finite automata that, uh, as you will see, <coughs> uh, recursion will come again to play a significant role. So. Um, the kind of the team of uh, these algorithms, uh, they are all uh, uh, based on essentially recursion as the main idea. So what is a, a finite automaton, right? So finite automaton, you can think of it, uh, uh, the easiest way to think of it is just a box, right? that can read a single symbol, right? And this box can be in a finitely many states, right? And now, depending on the state the automaton is and on the value of the symbol that it is reading, it will change its state from some state sigma 1 into another state, uh, sigma two, if here you have a symbol, um, well, maybe if it was in a state k, it will go into another state, uh, sigma m. 
if it sees uh, a symbol SI. And this transition is captured by a table, right? Uh, here are the states. So this is sigma 1, sigma 2. Uh, and depending how many states there are, say, uh, capital M. And here are all possible input symbols, uh, say, S1, S2, all the way to, uh, say, Sn. And then uh, if your automaton is in a state sigma k, and somewhere here is uh, Si, and is reading uh, a symbol Si, then the table will tell you into which state uh, uh, it will transition, right? So you can think this is kind of just a uh, um, kind of heuristic how to think about the automata. Of course, automata can be identified just by this table, right? Uh, that tells you uh, how, uh, how the transition of the states uh, uh, happen. Okay, so is this clear? So just, uh, so the idea now is uh, before you do the string matching, before you start searching for certain string, right? you will pre-process uh, uh, the string that you are uh, searching for by building a corresponding automaton that will look for uh, this string in an efficient way, uh, in a kind of, you will see, in a parallelized way, in a sense. So, what is the idea? Say the string is A, B, A, B, A, C, A. So the automaton has initial state. So, the, uh, so this is how many, uh, three and three, six, seven states, so seven letters. For seven letters, you need an automaton with eight states. Uh, in general, if the string is uh, m symbols long, your automaton will have m plus one states. And the states will be simply integers between zero and m, if m is the length of the string. So now, essentially, the state says uh, how many symbols have been matched so far correctly, right? So um, you start with zero matching symbols. So if your autom automaton is in the state zero, and if the input character is A, it will transition into a state one, signifying that uh, one uh, the first symbol of the string has been matched correctly, right? The inputs will come from the long string, right? So, but um, the automaton is defined using just the short string. So let's see. So uh, in case uh, if automaton is in state zero and the input symbol is, uh, for example, B, then the automaton will remain in state zero, right? Because B is not an initial uh, substring of this uh, string. So the only change into state one will happen when the automaton sees A as input, right? Now, if, it's, if the automaton is in state one and uh, the next, uh, and, uh, and it reads uh, a symbol B, what does it mean? Because the automaton is in state one, it means that one 
element has been matched. The next element, if it's B, then two elements are correctly matched, so the automaton will uh, um, change its state into state two. If it sees any other, let's see, if it sees uh, A, um, what will be, uh, the, what do you think, in what state will it go? If it's in state one and it sees an A, it will stay in state one because only one letter has been correctly matched as a prefix of the uh, target uh, string, right? Uh, for example, if two uh, uh, elements have been matched correctly and the automaton sees a, uh, 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 for example, a B, then you see A, B, B is not, no portion of it is a substring of uh, the target string, so the automaton will revert to the state zero. Right, for example, uh, let's see here, if uh, automaton is in state three, this means that uh, so far A, B, A have been correctly matched, so if the next symbol to be read is B, uh, automaton will go into state four. If the next, uh, so if the next symbol is A, uh, the automaton goes into as high state as possible so that uh, uh, the prefix defined by this state is a suffix of uh, what automaton sees, right? For example, here, if automaton see A, uh, what does it mean? So the sequence was A, B, A, uh, sorry, my eyes are A, B, A, A, the only um, uh, suffix that, is, uh, that can be salvaged is just a single letter A, so the automaton goes in, in state one. So in the same way, for example, if automaton is in the state four, so correctly matched letters are A, B, A, B, right? And uh, of course, if it sees another A, it will go into state five. From state five, if automaton sees B, right, it will go into the state four because it can use uh, um, four letters, A, B, A, B, right? So it always reverts to the state, right? so that the largest possible suffix is a prefix of the string. So it tries to salvage as much of what was previously matched, right? That is consistent with the new uh, symbol. Uh, so, uh, rather, so you can see then as we traverse uh, to the string, uh, essentially uh, rather than going, uh, verifying uh, letter by letter after each shift, uh, the automaton tells you what is the piece that can be salvaged and starts from there to match uh, the rest. Tries to see what is the largest piece that can be salvaged, that is a prefix of the target string that is consistent then to be extended with the next letter, right? So, um, this of course uh, uh, speeds up, it kind of parallelizes the search, right? Because when a search fails, uh, instead of starting from scratch, automaton reverts to the highest possible state, uh, right? With the largest uh, suffix of what has been matched so far, that is a prefix of the, uh, of the symbol uh, symbol B. So, um, how do we compute the transition function? That's exactly uh, what we said. Um, 
if pk denotes the prefix of the string p consisting of the first k letters, uh, then uh, if we are at the state k, this means that we have matched the prefix pk. Yeah? If we now see an input character a, yeah? then delta k a is the largest m such that the prefix pm of a string p is a suffix of the string pk a, namely um, the string extended by the new character, right? So it always tries to um, salvage as much of the previous mass uh, in the, of the previous, uh, uh, previously matched uh, string as possible, right? So you match, for example, Uh, say, uh, hmm. okay, now we have a logistical problem. So as the automaton traverses the long string, say so far it discovered that uh, this substring is an initial substring of uh, the target string B, right? And now what happens if uh, this new letter is the same as the letter here, of course it will just extend because it matched, it matches correctly, right? Now if there is a mismatch, uh, it will try to salvage as much as possible so that this piece, right, that this piece extended with this character is in fact a correct, uh, it's an initial, it's a prefix of B, right? So rather than doing it from scratch, uh, it always salvages as much as possible finds the largest prefix of the string B that is a suffix of what you had that can be correctly uh, extended by, uh, by uh, this uh, um, character. And that's precisely what, the, uh, what this transition function does, right? Because you always revert to the as high as possible. For example, here it would be state four, simply because the four letters um, here, A, B, A, B, are a prefix uh, of the target letter and they are suffix of, uh, they are the suffix of this substring extended with, uh, with a new uh, symbol. So, um, and of course, each transition is, uh, right, is just a one lookup in the table. So uh, the matching is extremely efficient. Once you reach the state seven, you do the following. The automaton outputs a message that a match has been found right? And then you see, even when the match is correctly found, after that you don't start from zero. When the match is, a perfect match has been found, right? Uh, then the automaton will continue by looking at the next character and trying to salvage as much as possible of this perfect match so that this substring extended with the new symbol is a prefix of B, right? So uh, you always try to, um, to salvage as much as possible from your uh, previous match. Okay, so uh, this is uh, how the string matching with finite automaton works. Now you see to fill this table, you need number of states that is one plus 
uh, the length of the target string that you are looking for times the number of characters that you have uh, of the alphabet over which the string is. Uh, and uh, there is a very clever algorithm that is also essentially the same algorithm as this one, except that this table is not constructed at all as a part of preprocessing, but instead uh, you construct a function that sort of replaces the table um, on the fly. So what is the idea? So the, the idea is, this is quite a famous uh, uh, algorithm, uh, Knut Morris Pratt algorithm for uh, string batching. And idea is uh, the following. So let me just ignore the code because it's uh, kind of not that uh, easy to figure out uh, what it does. Once you understand what the, uh, the algorithm does, you can then understand the code. So let's concentrate uh, uh, on an example here uh, that I did my best to kind of illustrate. So assume, so idea is, if you have a partial match, right? In this case, this will be this gray region so it will be this. And you get a new symbol. A single function tells you uh, what is the prefix, the optimal prefix, the longest possible prefix that is a suffix of this uh, um, string, right? Of the original string. So let's see how this works. So assume that you have matched um, that you have matched Q minus one many. Um, let me see. Just uh, what did I denote here? Um, so that you know for a string up to uh, Q minus one what is the largest suffix uh, of this string that is a prefix of the target string, right? So this is this string in, in gray. So for the large, um, yeah, so how would I explain this to you? Um, so, okay, so the idea is to find the kind of autocorrelation of the string with itself. Namely, to find prefixes that are also suffixes of a part of the whole string, right? So, for example, here, this uh, gray uh, bit is a prefix, right? That is also a suffix of the truncated string uh, up to uh, position Q minus one, right? So this is uh, a prefix because it's uh, on this end, but it also appears as a suffix for the truncation up to uh, Q minus uh, uh, first uh, position in the target uh, uh, substring. Now uh, you get a new element, uh, the next element, and you want to see uh, what will be, uh, how should your function map uh, this uh, um, new, uh, uh, essentially the new substring. So if you see, if this element is exactly equal to the next element here. What does it mean? It means that the prefix up to here can be extended to, for one cell further because here it is also, if, if this element uh, matches that element, right? Then you have a longer 
prefix here that is also a suffix up to position Q, right? However, if uh, there is a mismatch, if these two are not equal, then you look for this uh, um, substring, right? And you find what is the value by previously computed, right? Because this string is now shorter. By previously computed, uh, so the f definition of the function is essentially recursive. It will tell you what is the prefix of this longer prefix that is also a suffix here. And then you check whether you can extend this uh, suffix with PQ if it matches the extension here. And if the match is correct, then of course you will accept uh, that uh, the largest uh, uh, suffix that ends with element Q here will be precisely uh, the prefix uh, here, right? So instead of searching what is the max that I can salvage, you use the fact that for shorter strings, you already found out uh, what is the max that you can salvage, right? And if you fail, rather than looking from scratch, you simply use the very same mapping pi, right, to see for that shorter string, what is the substring, maximal substring that can be salvaged, and you check whether you can extend it by this new element. If the answer is yes, you, that's exactly the value um, of your function. If the answer is no, then for this shorter substring, you ask your function to see which is uh, its uh, uh, initial segment um, the largest initial segment that is also a, a suffix here, and you check whether you can extend it, uh, right? And you keep doing that, getting shorter and shorter uh, suffixes until you either find one, or if there is no, none, then of course the pi will, be, will send this land into zero because there are no matches. Okay, so it's kind of... Uh, tricky because after you, of course, do, you can see um, you can see that essentially computation of the prefix, it's almost the same as how you search uh, with uh, this prefix because pi function tells you if you have a mismatch, what can you salvage optimally and try to extend it with the next character. So it just tells you, it finds this point for you that tells you, well, this is the next possible candidate, try to extend it. If it, if it fails, then applying pi function to this subsegment will produce a shorter segment that you try to extend, and if you manage, that's, the, uh, that's the, essentially the new state. Okay, so, uh, and you know people say this is just pure magic. Um, so it's a very clever algorithm and it takes time to, even though the fundamental idea is uh, uh, really pretty simple, uh, you are simply searching uh, for prefixes of your substring that appear as suffixes and among them you look for the longest suffix that is also a prefix of the string. So you are kind of finding how correlated the string is uh, with itself because, for example, you find out that, uh, say, this prefix, if this is your B, if you cut it up to here, then this prefix also appears as the suffix of the truncated version. And you are always looking for the largest, the longest string that is suffix here and prefix of the same string. Because this gives you the function that tells you if you have a failure, uh, how to truncate uh, the string. But I guess, uh, you know, look, this uh, algorithm has a name of three extremely famous people. 
right? Notice the person who wrote this, The Art of Computer Programming, which is like the Bible. Uh, if you go to court and you are a computer scientist instead of the Bible, they ask you to uh, do an oath on Knut's book, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, it wouldn't have the name of three extremely famous people if it were trivial. So please read it carefully and uh, in general, if you are serious about being computer scientists, don't rely only on the notes, right? Um, read the textbook because it gives you much more details than what I can cover. I can just explain the basic principles to you, but if you don't want to become a dilettante, uh, then uh, uh, nothing replaces uh, reading the textbook. Okay, so... I'll see you next week.